Welcome back to yet another episode of Gas in the Mecca, and this week it's the third annual mid-year review. The Gas in the Mecca mid-year review is a bit of a different style of review, where it's not really about talking about what I liked and disliked about anime so far in the year, as it might suggest, but instead it's a bit more of a personal review where I sort of check in and talk about what what sort of lessons I've learned from anime recently, what some lessons and insights that I've learned about about anime or from anime um, from the year so far. So this is going to be a bit more of a relaxed episode. You could argue a bit of a um, bit of a personal therapy session with anime, <laughs> as well as just a few general musings. So you know, grab a cup of tea and enjoy this episode. So that is episode one hundred and fifteen, if I am correct, of the podcast, the Get in the Mecha Media Review twenty twenty two edition. For this year's media review, I bring you two lessons, two lessons I've learned about anime, I feel, or things that I've experienced, and I've decided to separate one into a lesson from watching anime films, and another related to the more usual TV anime. I've separated them partially because when it comes to films, I hardly speak about films on this podcast, which is quite unfortunate. Um, it's something I do want to maybe bring back or weave a bit more into the show. I, I don't know if there was even a time where I have spoken about films explicitly, um, but I do want to sort of bring that in. So the anime film lesson I've learned is a very simple one, but also one that has really transformed my experience. And it's the fact that anime in the cinema is in fact just really cool and I really recommend it. So I'm speaking more from a very newbie's point of view. I have watched, I can probably count on my fingers how many anime films I've seen in the cinema. And I know there are some people that have seen a lot more than me. So I'm not really speaking about this from a quote technical point of view, but just someone who's taking in a few things from watching anime movies in the cinema. And honestly, in the age of streaming, uh, it can be tempting, especially with the way anime releases work when it comes to films, of course, that's a whole thing. I didn't even write that in my notes, but um, especially in the age of streaming, it can be quite tempting to think that uh, why the heck would you want to watch an anime movie in the cinema when you can just wait for it to find itself onto the internet and find itself onto streaming sites um, or on a Blu-ray. And that's not a very bad thing or bad mentality to have because there are so many things that come down that it comes down to when as to why some people don't go to the cinema of course however if you actually do get the opportunity to go and it is accessible to you and in your means then I highly recommend it I really can recommend it enough but what it comes down to though isn't really about watching things early and being part of the conversation that really matters to me and I don't think it should matter to you either I can understand especially when you do have people based in other countries that are like oh yeah I watched this movie really early that yeah you you might want to also be part of that don't get me wrong but at the same time I think what's more important to me about the cinema experience is the actual audio visual experience and how transformative that is to one's understanding of anime if we're talking aspect ratios for a second and of course this isn't exclusive to anime but something that was really apparent to me when watching Jujutsu Kaisen Zero or Inubo at a recent um, early preview screening was really how 21 to 9, the aspect ratio 21 to 9 in a dark room really feels different to how it would when you are watching that on a TV screen or how you watch that on a laptop or something like that. Um, uh, mostly because when you are watching these in a dark room, the I, I guess the bars, which are the limits of the widescreen aspect ratio, just blend in with the rest of the room. It feels much more natural. And those on-screen limits don't really impose themselves on the same in the same way and same nature that they do when you are watching this in a more casual setting. There are cases for having a more invasive and visible limitations and I do acknowledge that I'll even get to that later into the episode because there is something slightly related to that. Um, but I, I think that the 
widescreen experience is much more natural in this way. And this is kind of even complemented depending on the film. So if you look at Jujutsu Kaisen Zero and um, Singer Park's style of directing, which is very based on color and color sets the tone and the mood, uh, at least more of the beginning of the movie. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how much he did towards the other parts, but you can tell the beginning is very, I'd say, Parkian in style, if I can say that. And that color contrast really fits with also just the dark room and those lack of limits. And the same applies to Inua as well, which has, I'll try my best to avoid spoilers for that movie because I know a lot of people have not seen it, but it has these more high contrast moments. And that, again, blended with the dark room really adds to, I'd say, just it's much easier to take in the direction, essentially, um, and just feel the entire thing and piece as a whole. Uh, as opposed to, I say, I guess, recognizing the limits and uh, recognizing what is there. It just feels like a more whole and connected experience. And then if we move on to Perfect Blue, which, uh, okay, I actually watched that at the end of 2021, but I'm going to cheat because I didn't actually do a formal review of the year last year. So I am going to talk about it anyway. (laughs) I think the cinema experience accentuates a lot of that film's realism and horror, I guess. There's something much more uncomfortable about watching in moments like the iconic Shinji Hashimoto scene in a sequence within the house or just pretty much any of them because there's so many uncomfortable ones. Seeing those facial details, of course, in 4K on that laser disc, Blu-ray, and also just it being on the big screen feels so much larger and again, much more uncomfortable. The visceral details are right in your face, even if you're not close to the screen per se. Like I was, I was kind of far from the screen to be fair but there was something about it that felt much more closer and I felt more close to that film than I ever have been versus watching it on my laptop for example in the middle of the night. It's also quite weird watching a movie with an audience. (laughs) It's something I didn't really think about until just now. Watching a movie with an audience really transforms the experience in a way that I didn't really quite think about. It's quite weird seeing people's facial reactions during the movie or even their post-film comments that you just hear you just hear like I I guess murmurs of as you exit the screen knowing that people are going through that same overwhelming experience that I am and going through that same I, I guess mind bend as the movie unfolds and this masterpiece unfolds is a really strange but comforting experience knowing that like I'm not the only one who's within the illusion and being messed with by Satoshi Khan, but everybody is at the same time. And just finally, what I also think makes this experience of, of Perfect Blue in the cinema such a, a strange one and really great one is the fact that um, you're watching it in a setting that's almost built for observing a performance being a cinema. Um, I'd say there's much more of a separation between real life and watching a performance in the cinema as opposed to watching it in your home setting. And of course, the mind bend of the movie comes from this question of whether you're watching a performance or not. You could argue maybe the home setting accentuates that because it's this mix of both. But I think when you are clearly going to watch a performance, if you refer to animation as a performance, that is, or film as a performance, although I I do personally, then the illusion, I think, becomes much stronger, more dense and menacing because what you came for is then very much just twisted in front of you. It feels like you're watching, at times, a documentary of this character's life. But at the same time, you feel what which you didn't arguably, quote, come for, even though I've seen the movie before. But then you end up watching a performance again. It's constantly dipping between these states. And I think the movie itself becomes so much more, I guess, again, menacing and almost insidious as a result. So that's really just the film lesson. Um, I think the cinema experience and watching movies, anime movies in the cinema is a really cool one and something that can really, again, elevate the experience. So uh, even though I, I was a bit skeptical, that like, how different is this? But it really is. And I do recommend it if you do have the means and access to do so. And then on to our second and final lesson for this podcast, that is the TV anime lesson. And what I've really learned from TV anime this year so far 
is something quite, it's quite small, you could say, because it is about small things. And it's this idea that sometimes less is more and that smaller ideas can go a long way. I don't want to plug my stuff too much, even though this is my own platform. But if you have been reading some of the articles that I have been, that I have written, that I dropped in the community feed, if you are on YouTube or just like, if you just read the blog at all, you'll know that this is something that I've been exploring exploring quite a bit. And I guess something that I kind of explore regularly on the podcast in general, it's this idea that there are some things within a show's visual language that can really um, elevate the entire thing, even though the thing themselves that is doing the elevation is very small or quite minuscule, or arguably what some people say is unimportant or not that deep. This, of course, isn't something that I literally just realized in the year 2022 and just now, but I would say that there are two artists that have really turned me on to this idea and really led me to it. And uh, the two are one in which I have spoken about endlessly, Keishiro Saito, another arguably friend of the show at this point. We're building a list now. And (laughs) Toshimasa Ishii, the director of 86 and assistant director of Erased. In the case of Saito, I think it's really just the sense of liminality and emptiness they apply to a lot of their work. Of course, we can point to Sonny Boy and the the potential influence of Shinko Natsume, but I think it's probably more productive to look at their stuff outside of Shinko Natsume now and seeing how that's evolving. And a, a really great example of this recently that kind of confirmed a lot of my point was The Executioner and Her Way of Life ending sequence, which goes by the name of Thomas Shibi Serenade. So much of the mystery and nostalgia in this ending sequence is created not by throwing in more things to create this confusing, dense experience, but in fact stripping things back and making some of the frames as bare and ambiguous as possible to create this almost fuzzy memory feeling where I guess your memories are almost partially blank and you can't fill in everything. Not to make this too much about me, but I think I've kind of learned this a bit as a creator as well, where sometimes your best things come out of doing less by not writing streams of paragraphs, not by making a 40 minute episode, but making a really concise and good 20 minute one, or just, you don't always have to do the most in order to create maximum impact or the best effect. Length, as well as just, I guess, density, as we're talking about the Saito ending, isn't that important. It's always, it's not always about increasing things, but in fact, making things more minimal and uh, stripping things back can, can do wonders, honestly. And I've learned that myself and from Saito's work as well. If we switch over to Toshimasa Ishii's work on 86, Ishii essentially transforms those barriers that we often speak about into something much more. He creates this, I guess he turns it into the mental fortress of the character Shin in that entire episode. And then of course we have the other character, Lena, who steps over those. And it speaks to the whole idea that they're sort of meant to be together and they kind of need one another. But the point still stands that this transformation of 21 to 9 is what made this episode, made that episode what it was and made 86's final two episodes. Honestly, a a really great way to end a season I was quite mixed on, or at least a part of a season that I was quite mixed on. If anyone wants to really dive into that a bit more, uh, I do have the article, but I'd also recommend watching Erased as well, directed by Tomiko Ito, as this is something that he does in there as well. We did touch on this one talking about Link Lick, but this was when I kind of forgot about Erased and the fact that Erased maybe even does this a bit better, where it makes us aware that we're in the flow of time by turning again the barriers of the 21 to 9 aspect ratio into a real film we're constantly aware that we're in the flow of time and things are all in flux and it makes erase feel so much more i guess tense that we're simply watching something that we can't control (laughs) what we believe we can't control as viewers and that's what really made the erase experience most interesting for me but overall things that might appear as small gimmicks are worth looking at 
that. I, I don't want to repeat myself from last episode, um, as that was that was a much better way of putting it. But uh, just kind of to put a cap on this section as well as just the entire episode, because there there aren't many closing thoughts to say after this, is that. Uh, when it comes to TV anime and just anime as a whole, I think minor things are worth looking at, as always, or things you might consider minor, reconsider, think about what this might be doing and how this is taking your experience to another level, even things you might take for granted, like, yeah, just watching something on a cinema, in a cinema, watching something in a dark room, watching something with an audience, watching something not in 16 to 9 or your, quote, typical aspect ratio think about those things because I think, or well, I will definitely be thinking about those things because they've changed my entire perception of anime, honestly, and have made it much more, uh, I think I respect anime even more than I do now, just because I've realized those things and woken up to uh, how much they do for the things I enjoy. Thank you for listening to yet another episode of Gas in the Mecca. This was kind of just a canvas to throw some thoughts around in this year's review. Uh, but, but I hope you did enjoy it and you got something from it and something from the things that have been bubbling in my mind for quite a while now. So as always, if you want to support the podcast, you can, of course, leave a review on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. And on Apple Podcasts, you can also leave a worded review. And if you do leave a worded review, then I will read it at the beginning of the episode as a way of saying thank you. But anyway, thank you for listening. And I will see you on another episode of Get in the Mecca. Hopefully not too long, but um, yeah, have, have a good day and see you in the next episode. The music in this episode goes as follows. Chill, Adventure Time Revised, On the Road Again, and Synthwave by Alex. And all this music is done by Alex McCulloch and is under the public domain.